Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and by popular demand, I am delighted again to be able to speak to Paul Jordan, CEO and founder of Amati Global, one of the UK's most successful fund managers. So welcome, Paul. Great pleasure to be with you again, Paul. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, I mean, there's been lots of um, turmoil going off on the markets um, in January, largely on the back of sort of central bank tightening, fears over interest, future interest rate rises, and now sort of a bit of geopolitical tension in, in uh, Russia and Ukraine. What's your sort of like broad outlook for equities going forward? Well, I think it's uh, we're, we're in a much tougher environment than we were Ironically, uh, a year ago when we were in the midst of the pandemic, it's sort of bizarre that now that the pandemic is uh, becoming more of a, an endemic disease, that actually things are toughening up. But, um, you know, as, as you've said, there's a number of things we've got to really keep an eye on. The Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, invasion um, that's, that's sort of kind of being planned very carefully by President Putin for many months um, you know, that is incredibly serious and we shouldn't underestimate it. It's, it's much more than a piece of geopolitical tension. Mm. Uh, you know, this is a very carefully planned invasion. And every time uh, Vladimir Putin says we're not planning to invade, we should get very worried because, you know, that is a very sure sign that he is planning to invade. Yeah. But, you know, he, he's, he's done everything you'd have expected somebody planning an invasion to do, uh, including, interestingly, and, and maybe not everyone's picked up on this, but, you know, very... Foolishly, Germany sold its its gas storage to Gazprom uh, a few years back. So about a third of German gas storage is owned and controlled by Russia. And you know, interestingly, it just so happened that this year Russian didn't fill up the reserves, so they're empty. And you know, that's exactly the kind of thing you do if you're planning to cause a lot of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's very important with I think with political leaders, especially ones like that who've um, who are despotic and have been in power for a long time. You have to always look at what they do, not at what they say. What they say is completely irrelevant and very misleading always. Mm -hmm. uh, you just look at what they're actually doing if you want to predict what's going to happen. So, you know, I do take that very seriously. Um, if Russia does invade Ukraine, um, and I suppose Crimea started this really, but um, it would be a major breakdown of the, almost like the post-World post War II settlement with the United Nations where really a, a kind of new world order was established, where which really made it virtually impossible for one state just to go and invade another one and take it over and have everyone recognise that. Mm. You know, that was the pre-war situation. You know, go, actually goes back to the Treaty of Westphalia, interestingly, you know, long way mm. back in history, when after that treaty, it was kind of, everyone acknowledged that if you just had the army, you could go and take a state and everyone would then recognise it was yours. You know, since World War II, that's not been the case. And really, I think a big chunk of the importance of what's going on in Ukraine, apart from the fact that it's just horrible, is that it challenges this, uh, you know, the, the, the foundations of our peace and stability worldwide, which is, has, made, has meant that, you know, just because you're strong enough to take over a state doesn't mean you can do it. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's now threatened. So, you know, I do take that pretty seriously. You might, you might say, well, how does that relate to markets? Of course, it's a political point I'm making. And linking political political points to markets is very difficult, as we know, certainly not a straight line. But um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's, it's, a very, it's a very significant thing. And it is clearly making markets, participants in markets, very uncomfortable, rightly so at the moment. What would you say the sort of probability of, of that happening of an invasion from Russia? Because it would be a huge own goal. I mean, admittedly, it might sort of like get him a few bit of more local you know domestic votes with the um the populace in russia but frankly it would just put them as a sort of pariah as it more of a pariah across the whole of the world well yes i i, I you know then question mark does vladimir putin really care about that i, yeah, okay. I absolutely don't think he does yeah. so yeah i mean we have these debates i mean uh, the, the opposing view to mine is that it's just saber rattling and, and he wants concessions mm. um which he's not going to get you know, I personally don't see it that way. I, I think this is very carefully planned and staged invasion. You might say, what is he after? Actually, probably all he's after is a change of government in Ukraine. So he gets mm. his own person in there, mm. and then effectively he controls it. Mm. So, you know, people are saying, oh, well, he couldn't occupy it and, and keep it. And that's true. But that's not what he's really, that's not really the objective. The objective is to control and get, you know, change the politics of Ukraine. And then, he, he, you know, we can give his troops around to be aggressive. Um, 
But once you once you've it's, it's a regime change operation, really. Mm-hmm. That like we saw, uh, we were familiar with those from the Middle East. Um, yeah. Yeah, but um, and how how long do you think the turbulence, current turbulence, is going to last for? Just I mean, and obviously it's impossible to say, but just gut feel, sort of. We've had a really rough, obviously, first month with the AIM index, small cap down over ten percent, and Nasdaq, I think, is down twelve or thirteen percent in the same period. Yeah, and those what those headline index movements cover up is, you know, we've had we've had one thing that you know I think was kind of to be expected that, that we've had a re-rating or a de-rating of high growth companies, uh, which, you know, arguably were very frothy last year and, and there was lots of liquidity around. People were optimistic about what was coming with innovative businesses. And, you know, it, we are clearly in a world where innovation matters hugely and, mm. you know, the innovative companies kind of own the future. That's true. But, you um, it's always the question is to what degree can you depend on that and how confident is the market going to be about it? And the market's now less confident about that. So we've seen pretty sharp D ratings. And actually one, one thing we quite often look at is if you look at, uh, if you take an company share price and you take its EPS forecast at a given date and point and you index them to 100 and you can look at how the two have moved in percentage terms. You know, what we saw last year with quite a lot of the high growth companies is that they had re-rated upwards. Uh, quite significantly. And so what we've seen in the last few months is that's really kind of blown off the top and most of them have really derated back to their longer term uh, trends and, and also back in, in line with the EPS growth, which is what you'd expect really. And there is a question over whether that carries on and they derate relative to where they were five years ago. That could happen if, if they, you know, in a, in a tough market. Um, but, you know, that, then overlaying that is the question of what happens to earnings and the, and the earnings scenarios I think get a bit tougher for companies from here um, mm. so it won't be as easy to outperform and deliver really wonderful upgrades that we've been seeing in the last two years uh, but it won't be impossible either so you know the best companies will do that um, but there'll be there'll be fewer of them that manage it mm. so um, it's going to be a stock picking sort of like um, competition is it <laughs> for the rest of the year yes yeah yes. I, I did see uh, the one one trend is which is actually sort of like quite persistent is the MA. and big congrats last week i saw one of your portfolio companies i know we've talked about it, air partner getting taken out by uh, us wheels up uh, or being a, a agreed bid anyway at 125p but is that a trend that's likely to continue as well because obviously the P, you, you know uk plc is still p- pretty cheap and has just got cheaper as well but especially in your sort of like sweet spot of small and mid caps yeah I, I think it will carry on and and you know but it will it'll be the companies which are out of favor and overlooked and a bit beaten up and have got a lot of value in them that will get taken over most readily uh you know it won't really help the sort of super high growth innovative companies because they're kind of too expensive to take over but you know something like air partner was you know obviously in hindsight you look at it and you think well yeah that makes sense you know it's it's um got a lot of attractions for the US buyer. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, so I think we will see more of it. Yeah. yeah. And then just moving now to sort of like um, onto some new positions. And I think one of those you talked about, which is which is a sort of like a, a stock that's really cheap, um, is, is, is Halfords. Could you take us through that one? Because, uh, I mean, I looked at it. I looked at it on the actual, the PE ratio. And the current levels at, at 325p, it trades at less than 10 times forward PE. It does. And it's, you know, it's a company that has been through sort of, you know, quite a rigorous process of improving itself mm-hmm. over the last few years. And, you know, I don't know, don't know about you, but I, I shopped at Halfords last year because I, you know, and I don't, I, I don't often go in the market for that kind of stuff, but, you know, I found myself going there and they were excellent. And, mm. you know, because it's not just the point, I think what they've really done, and I think it's quite clever is they've, move beyond just being a retailer to being a service provider and a retailer. Mm. So if you go to Halfords, they'll not just sell you the kit, they'll fit it for you and they'll advise you, you know, you need this one, you need that. So it's a helpful place to go. It solves problems rather than just sells you stuff. Mm. And, I th- and now they've, you know, the catalyst for us was they acquired uh, National Tire, uh, which obviously is a, is a service company and it gives them a nationwide footprint. Mm. It's a very good way of extending what they do at the Halford shops for automotive. And now they can fit your tires and do you know, bits of servicing and exhaust and all of that kind of thing. So, you know, we felt that was a, a pretty smart move. And, uh, we, you know, as you say, it's it's a lowly rated company. 
um, you know, we're, we're certainly adding into the mix, you know, companies of that type this year because we think they they should be able to perform pretty robustly. It's a dividend payer. Um, yeah, we, we like it. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, I, I would agree. Going into that servicing, the, the do it for you type of stuff with cars becoming more electric and all driven by all software then it's very difficult for your mom and pop sort of like um, garage down the road to keep up with the technology and therefore having scale that you can then help people who drive around in a, say, an electric vehicle to service because because effectively individuals are never going to be able to do it not now with all the software it's just impossible without the diagnostics i guess uh, yeah i mean it's an interesting point i mean you know it's, it's one of my or well, two of my colleagues covered the automotive sector but you know they were saying to me recently that um, the, the, what the um, the car dealerships have been saying is that it's not actually really clear what servicing EVs are going to need. Mm. They're too new, so you know how much. So obviously, they need a lot less servicing than uh, internal combustion engines. Um, electric motors are much simpler, but it's not quite clear what they are going to need. And so mm. that that's the whole new era. But you know, we, nonetheless, for the next decade at least, we're going to have a big car park of of internal combustion engine cars, and of course, tires and you know, the kind of uh, the, the accessories that you need in cars, uh, you know, things like um, um, tow bars and all that kind of thing, which is Halford's meat and drink. They, you know, yeah. that's, that applies whether it's electric or internal combustion. So, yeah, you know, we think they're well, we think they're well placed actually in come what may with, with the automotive, uh, you know, what happens in the car industry. Yeah. And then another one you've brought in, which is actually the other side of the other other um, uh, part of the barbell, I guess, is uh, is auction technology, which I think listed last year at around about six pounds. Shares are over ten pounds currently, and then they raised, I think it was uh, one hundred almost one hundred ninety million at fifteen pounds to buy live auctioneers. It is, it is auction tech, and that one is a, a fascinating, high quality type of business, isn't it? Yes, and you know my it's it's um, my colleague Anna who, who covers that one, and mm. we, yeah, it was a fun. It's one of the best IPOs of last year. Mm. It's a you know it is um, best in class at what it does, running running live auctions online. Uh, so it's so they will provide their software platform to auction houses around the world. So that you know the auctions are put on by third parties that but they provide the software to run them, and it's you know if you're the auction house involved it's what they bring is not just the software they're bringing a massive network of buyers because mm -hmm. they have all these users of their technology so they can increase the number of people viewing an auction pretty significantly and that's got a value so that there's a strong network effect mm -hmm. with that company which is why we like it mm -hmm. obviously it's highly rated i think the money they raised was wasn't quite at 15 i think it was a tiny bit lower but yeah we we have you know, taken a bit of profit in it but we still really like it as a as a, as a business um mm -hmm. You know the, the rating's been under pressure, but you know it's, it's one where we think the business should really carry on performing, and that's that's really what's going to matter for that company. Yeah, it, it's a best in class dominant sort of category killer, isn't it? Because uh, it is, once yeah. you get that networking effect, it be, the barriers to entry from any other sort of player is is almost impossible. So it's a bit like a it's a more, it's, it's a bit like right move, but sort of like with lots and lots of different sort of like um, really strong um, expertise areas. And another one which has been beaten up, actually, which is listed as a new position, is Victoria Plumbing in the um, UK, really re repair maintenance type of. Um, it's yeah. an on, I think it's an online one stop shop for all things bathroom, sort of accessory and um, sort of um, just just people allows people to buy bathroom stuff. Yes, I mean it's one where we bought that at IPO. We got a small position. It, mm. You know, our, our mistake with that one was that. The rating was just too high, and it was the, the IPO was too exuberant. Um, but nonetheless, we we do think it's a really good company, and mm. um, you know the, the the thing to look at really with that one is the twenty year. You can see a twenty year track record, and it's, it, the founder has. It, it's it's really the um, again. It's a kind of category killer of online retailer for yeah. all things plumbing and bathroom related. Um, it's taken an incredible market share. Over twenty year period, uh, and, and I think it, he'll continue to to take market share. That's really the test of it. So, mm. you know, it has been really beaten up. Um, the market didn't like the fact that uh, last November the, the the market overall for that kind of plumbing equipment uh, didn't do what it was supposed to. It's supposed to grow, and it just didn't grow. You know, that I don't think that's going to be 
um, the case for too long. And, and you know, we do it actually outperform the market in, in um, I think the market might have actually shrunk in November overall and they stayed flat. So every period it sort of, it does better, better than the market overall. So actually that's one where we decided to, unusually, we decided to buy more of it when it, you know, after that mm. time when it, you know, at about a pound or just below, it, it just felt to us that's too low for this kind of quality of business. Yeah. So we are still we're optimistic about it. The, the important thing to bear in mind with it for, the, for this year is that they're, launch, they're relaunching their website with a brand new kind of uh, refresh in the middle of the year. And it's going to bring a whole load of new features, I, I, I understand, including the ability to kind of design your software, your bathroom online, so you can see what it looks like. And that's going to make buying a whole lot easier and hopefully continue to differentiate them from the competition, which they're, they're already differentiating that they just have far more availability of SKUs, of, of stock items than you'll find elsewhere. But, you know, it's, it's, it, and that's with e-tailing, with, with an online retailer, one thing you look for is do they just have a bigger range than everybody else? And Victorian Plumbing does. It's substantially bigger. So you know if you go there, you can just see so much more than you can see anywhere else. Mm. Oh, I love that idea of having a digital twin being able to sort of like uh, put augmented reality or virtual reality onto an existing bathroom and then overlay what you potentially good and you can do different varieties. The problem with that is my wife's going to be changing all our bathrooms really <laughs> soon on the back of it. Expect so, a big bill. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. So she may be heading straight for a Victoria plumbing uh, fairly soon. <laughs> But um, hopefully, hopefully we'll wait and see. Um, and then another ones we sort of run your winners. I know we talked about it. Um, let's start with um, Sayeta. Obviously, um, you bought in at the IPO 120p, and the shares have done very well at about 100. Sorry, 210, 220p. Um, does electric axial flux uh, motors for sort of two and three wheelers uh, out in Asia, but also has got sort of other different uh, opportunities with outboard um, motors for for motorboats and or indoor. Uh, and also high performance cars. Do you want to take us through that one? Yes, we, we actually invested in that pre IPO with our VST and, and really helped it to float because we, mm. we thought this would be a great company to have on the market. And we thought actually this electric motor they've got uh, looks like a you know, fundamentally important design that should you know, enable uh, electrification in all kinds of places for automotive. Um, and originally their, their, their aim was to target the as you know, Paul, mm. uh, they're aiming to target the two-wheeler market in Asia, yeah. which is vast, and that's still the plan. That that doesn't happen overnight. You know, nothing in automotive is quick, so they need some faster routes to commerciality than that. Even though that's the, a massive prize in the future, and so they've they built and designed a complete outboard motor using their using their electric motor, but it's the whole kit. So you just you buy their unit and you stick it on your boat. Um, you know, they've already virtually sold out of what they can make of those things, mm. I, you know, I, I expect. Uh, they launched it a few weeks ago in Amsterdam. It seems to have gone very well. And they actually produced this great video of a side-to-side boat, you know, boat with the main competitor, which is called Torquedo, and one boat with their motor in. And it looked like it had been rigged because their one was just so much better. I just said, said to Vic <laughs> after you, come on, <laughs> that can't be real. <laughs> but, um, so it is it's to do with torque density, what makes a good yeah. electric motor. You need more power in the same space, and that's what they bring to the market, as well as more efficiency, which makes your battery last longer. Um, but actually, the, the thing that they then did, and this was really a piece of pure luck in a way, but you, know, you have to make your own luck, and this is a good illustration of that. They then bought a company called E-Traction in mm. Holland. And you know, there's a great story behind this because you know, Vic was, he was actually in Slovenia looking at a company that makes inverters because you know, they've got the motor, but to make, to make a motor into a unit that becomes a drivetrain in a vehicle, you need an inverter as well. Mm. And they were trying to source the right inverter technology. And then he, he saw advertised in a kind of Dutch media source uh, that this business E-Traction was being sold by Evergrande, the Chinese company, mm. who'd invested hundreds of millions in um, getting into electric vehicles in various ways, and this was one of them. Um, and it was a Dutch business, so they only adver- advertised it in Dutch. And you know, Vic is, is yeah. himself from Holland, so he could read this stuff. I don't think very many people saw this. And he <laughs> immediately went there and started work and got his corporate finance team involved and said, you know, we need to buy this. The starting price, I understand, was 28 million euros that Evergrande wanted it. And they must have spent at least 50, 60 on this. And probably by the time you had on all the, everything they invested, more than that. Mm. And in the end, they negotiated it for one euro plus up to 1.8 million 
or two million euros more yeah, that's it. if they can um, get the tax losses in the business and, and that's yet to be determined um so eventually they were given they were essentially they were given this business and it's mm. it's a fabulous business by the look of it and it has inverter technology so they now own their own inverter technology uh, and it has a drivetrain already made and sold into big commercial mm. vehicles like buses mm. so it's taken them to whole new areas um it's it's actually you know it's leapfrogged where we thought they would be right now by some margin mm. And then what we're waiting for really is a decision from the company over to where to locate a factory. They need to scale up production. And so, you know, we'll hopefully in the next month or two, we'll get some news from them as to where they're going to go with that. Mm. Yeah, that e-traction looked like the deal of the century, that one. Was absolutely yeah. fab. I mean, you, they were obviously a distressed seller, Evergrande, so uh, you, they got the timing uh, absolutely perfect. Another one to sort of like, on your running your winners is Equals, which has done really well, which is that B2B e-payments, uh, international, uh, well, international payments, Forex, uh, uh, biz, fintech business, but run by Ian uh, Stratford-Taylor, um, which has yeah. actually it's done really well over the last uh, 18 months. Now, trading at about 76. P. Yes, it's been, it's really kind of got its act together equals. It's really good to see. Mm. It's been quite a long journey with them on, on the A market. And mm. you know, they had, they suffered in a way from all the capital that got thrown at companies like Revolut and Monzo mm. and who were giving away foreign exchange for nothing and that mm. undermined their retail card business. But, you know, they've been very clever at the way they've reinvented what they do, which is now very much focused on the corporate market with, you know, still a, re- a legacy retail business in there. And they, they've, you know, developed these products. They're, they're, the engineering under the bonnet is pretty sophisticated and needs to be. And yeah, I think they're making good progress. So mm. yeah, I'm pleased with how that's developed. Yeah, I did see that their uh, their now run rate is about um, just over a million pounds uh, a, a week. And um, one of your uh, one of your colleague, not colleagues at uh, Marty, but a sort of fellow fund manager, uh, Andy Bruff, bought a big chunk off. Uh, I think it was Richard Bernstein off Crystal Amber just recently. So that oh, yeah. it's, it's uh, it says quite a lot that the uh, the quality of the uh, shareholder register is, uh, is 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 even increasing from what it currently is. So. Uh, Quite interesting. Another one which is has been a, a really good winner for you guys, but has actually just just sold off largely on the back of a sort of like a negative report out from ShareScope from a, a, a financial blog, a Maynard Payton, I think it is. But it, it's Cake Box, which does it's sort of like egg free, delicious sort of a uh, you know cakes across the uh, across the country. It's a hundred percent franchise, but the shares now are really trading at um, ridiculously low values. And I did see the CEO pick up some shares last week at about £2.20, but I think, sorry, £2.50, but they're, they're currently at about £2.20. What's your sort of view on sort of Kate Box and, and also, you know, these, these type of um, one-off events where somebody does a negative report and it sends the share price down? I mean, I think, um, yeah, yeah I mean, Kate, Kate Box has been a remarkable growth mm. story. And I think what we're seeing is really kind of classic growing pains when a company, you know, has internal systems that are okay for one size, but don't really work when it gets bigger. Yeah. And, you know, the the the, the guy who wrote the blog, you know, picked up some, some made some valid points and that, you know, they, they'd made some very careless, just mm-hmm. kind of administrative errors in their annual report. And it, you know, so what inevitably will be happening is that they'll add in a whole load of extra processes, improve the internal governance, uh, you know, there's no suggestion there's any kind of fraud or bad practice, but it's made a, made the market very uneasy. So, yeah, the shares have sold off a long way, as you point out, and mm. hopefully a good value here. Um, you know, it's been a remarkable growth story. There's there's a lot more they can do with that business, uh, but it just hit a juncture where, you know, they clearly need to tighten up on some of their internal administrations and, and they're appointing an internal auditor and extra NEDs and you know, doing the right things. Um, mm. Yeah, I think it's it's the kind of situation where it takes a little while to the company then to prove it's sort of you know move it's it's addressed the issues and moved on, mm. um, and hopefully we'll continue to see the company really prospering. Yeah. Other ones which are sort of like, you know, IPR, IPR rich um, type businesses that have sort of like had a couple of speed bumps, sort of in the healthcare sector. But so let's start with um, Tristel, which is a best in class sort of like infectious uh, disease control business that it makes sort of wipes and foams and sprays and stuff for hospitals, largely for uh, small sort of like instruments, medical instruments, etc. Do you want to take us to that? Because that, it was an absolute darling and has now come off, but it's a high quality stock. 
Yeah, it is a high quality start. And I suppose it, quite a number of healthcare companies, and Tristel is maybe a good example of that, mm. had, you know, they 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 got re-rated up with the pandemic because everyone mm. thought, well, it's healthcare, they'll be all right. And then actually a lot of them have had some problems with the fact that there's so many staffing issues and in, in, in healthcare um settings that everything kind of that can be put on hold gets put on hold. So sales cycles get a bit longer. And um you know, it's 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 nothing. It's not not a um, you know. It's not really that anything the companies can much do about that. Um, but it will pass, and things will ease, and you know, accommodations will be made to, and that already have been made to coronavirus. So we're not seeing the same length of isolation being imposed and the same length of absences. So I think as hospitals return to a bit more to normal, then uh, Tristel and a number of other companies in the same sector will should see their ability to to ramp up sales to the, you know, the run rates they're used to mm. should should return yeah. and actually we've just seen a statement from craneware it's a company we like a lot this morning talking about a slight elongation of sales cycles for the same reason right yeah you know, i think it's reasonably temporary but you know everyone will be relieved to see the back of that because and uh, the good news about that if it happens is it means that hospitals are normalized which is very important we see them doing that for everyone's sake because we, mm. we we need them to get back to normal yeah yeah well is i mean just in the uk isn't it or just in england there's a six million patients backlog that has to be yeah. cleared of waiting lists so uh, those are whole electrics um sorry elective procedures need to be um sort of cleared and i know the i mean that's the gold point of the government putting um national insurance up isn't it in in april and march it's better fund the nhs to clear years and years of potential backlog so you're right i think that's going to be a major secular grow grow story anybody associated with um you know sort of getting the hospitals getting back to normal should um uh, should benefit what well, which is um I know we chatted about it before and has been right on my radar myself. I- I- Ixico, which does sort of like, um, I think it's AI, big data enhanced um, sort of uh, di- well, diagnostics and also for sort of drug discovery purpose in neuroscience. And uh, I thought the whole industry would, have, would turn a new leaf because Biogen obviously got its sort of lead drug approved by the FDA, but then it has got a whole bunch of uh, criticism and Ixico has obviously had a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a, a an issue with one of its largest clients in the Huntington disease. Their candidate didn't come through. So you want, you want to take us through how you see that 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 company sort of position going forward? Yes, I mean, yeah, you know, Ixico has done a great job with developing its mm. business, and it's it's a world leader at analysing images of the brain. Mm. And, and so, when you're running a trial for an Alzheimer's um, drug. You know, you, in order to be able to assess whether the drug works, you want to get the best images, and they bring artificial intelligence to bear on the analysis of those images. So that's pretty important, um, pretty important stuff. And they, you know, they win a lot of business of the new trials that are being done. Um, but the downside is that you know, Huntington's Alzheimer's, you know, these are incredibly difficult diseases to treat. Mm. Uh, they've just proven to be very knotty, and you know, so many of the drugs that have been developed for them just haven't worked well enough. Uh, and you know, there's downside and upside to that. The upside is we need more trials and we need more drugs, and that's more with more business for Exco. But the downside is, you know, when a big program fails, that's a quite a big short-term loss of business for them, and they've got to then wait for that to be replaced. And you know, the whole market is growing, and their their market positioning is very good, but they are subject to these kind of setbacks. When when a, when a big phase three project falls over and gets cancelled, you know, that is that's that's painful. It's nothing they can't deal with. But it's, it's, there's no getting away from it. It's a setback, and yeah. you know, I think the company will move on beyond it and win, you know, win the next trials. And there's no doubt that more drugs will be developed because we we need treatments for these diseases. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's in the nature of the business, and we need to remember that with a company like Xco that it can have these setbacks. And it's true of lots of medical services companies. You know, if you, you have to remember there's a risk that something in trials doesn't work because mm. most of the time they don't work. Yeah. Can you move into sort of diagnostics at all? Di- diagnosis? Because I know, um, I mean, Cambridge Cognition <clears throat> had a similar issue, but they have sort of like do helping now sort of like um, uh, healthcare companies diagnose people with dementia and stuff like that. And it, it's again, it's, it's sort of like scanning the brain to see whether these guys, or is it really just a different type of technology? Um, no, I, I absolutely think it's got some applications in diagnostics, but mm. to get there, you need the treatment. So when there's, you know, I think the way the way this will unfold for Exco in the long run is that you know one of these treatments will eventually work, 
Mm. And then in the use of that treatment, I think it's pretty right. likely that you get your assessment yeah, done okay. by an Exco brain scan. Yeah, okay. And good. that was going to be the plan with Biogen, I understand. You know, there was going to be surveillance of the, the usage and, and you know, I, there, there was a plan for the, it's, the Exco scan to be integral to the use of the drug. Mm. And that, you know, that I think they will get there. And I think that's the way it will go, but we're a little way off that still. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Another one which has got great publicity over the weekend from the PVC is Polarian uh, Imaging. And obviously it got that sort of like, uh, I think it was, you know, a letter just deferring its approval from the FDA, uh, probably for another sort of 12 months or so. Do you want to take us through Polarian? Because obviously when we last chatted, I think the shares were about a pound and now around about sort of 60p or just south of 60p because uh, they got this um, this pushback from the FDA in October. Yes, there's a couple of things to say here. I mean, let's talk about the BBC article first, which was fantastic to see. Yes, it was. Very exciting news. And, you know, I... I always thought that this you know polarian's technology would be really mm. valuable in long mm. covid and and that's kind of been demonstrated yeah. um you know, a 100 patient study it's not huge but it was the previous study was only 10 so it's mm. a lot bigger than that um yeah i mean it's it's a slight shame that the professors who ran that study didn't credit polarian mm. uh, with a, and, and the reason they didn't was because polarian didn't pay for that study but it's a little bit mean of them because, you know, actually people like that have to remember that they need companies like Polarin to develop these products and it's an yeah. expensive thing to do. So they could have been a bit more generous about that. But, um, you know, there's a close association and Polarin are very, have been very supportive of that trial and are going to continue to support the work in, in Oxford. Um, and you know, it's important work. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it hopefully will be... Uh, um, uh, you know, hopefully it would catalyze some kind of move to get the product mm. approved in Europe and the UK, which is not on the cards at the moment. Mm. Um, but actually, you know, I, I was wondering over the weekend whether that opens a door for some kind of accelerated approval in the UK. I mean, it's it's an incredibly easy device to approve. Mm. You know, it's a piece of almost bureaucratic nonsense. And it's part of the whole medical thing that we do, that this has been so held up. Mm. And, you know, the, the other thing to say about the FDA is that, you know, it's deeply frustrating for investors that, the FDA has become pretty dysfunctional mm. and is not really approving anything on time. Just yes, nothing. Right. Yeah. And, and actually they use this CRL, which is what they gave Polarian, the complete response letter, simply to get more time in a way that doesn't affect their funding. If they just they can only delay so many results past the past the regulatory date. And there's a, there's a there's a regulatory timetable. And if they delay too many things past that, then they start to lose funding. Yeah. So it's much easier for them to say to give a pushback like they did to Polarin, especially it's a small company. They don't think anybody really cares about it too much, you know, it's, but it's really bad behavior and, and um, completely unfair on the company mm. who you know did everything that they needed to do to get this approved. And the fact that they haven't, you know, there comes a point when actually this is just very commercially damaging for development of new treatments and medicines at, at large. So I really hope the FDA are going to address what's going on and pull their socks up a bit, basically. Yeah, um, I think all of the healthcare authorities, are, <clears throat> they've been totally snowed, haven't they, trying to approve everything to do with COVID, whether it's vaccines, yes. antivirals, other sort of diagnostics, whether it's rapid flow or, or PCRs and all this sort of stuff. And it's sucked in so much of their resource that they've become totally overloaded. And also, I think, because of the <clears throat> salaries in the industries, healthcare industry have gone up. And they probably <laughs> probably had a lot of turnover probably had a lot of turnover. So, uh, yeah, their resource, uh, the, res the demand and supply of the available yes. resource is probably a big mismatch. Another well, one which, yeah. yeah, another one which is sort of like, uh, again, has had pushback, not pushback from the FDA, but has been delayed by three months. And likewise, with the um, the European Healthcare uh, Authority, the, the, the EMA uh, on Friday, is Amrit Pharma with their oleo gel. Um, but, that, I mean... They're, they do seem to have priority status in the FDA, so I don't think they can push it back any further from uh, from from February. But what's your view? Yeah, it's the same, exactly the same frustration. You know, mm. this is this is deeply unfair on the companies involved to be just late, yeah, giving the results. And it's yeah, I mean, what can one say? It's it's um, that, that's all there is to it. I mean, you know, I I, re I really hope they'll get the approval, and and you know, because of course. If you're the regulator in that position, it's always easier just to say no than to say yes. Mm -hmm. And that would be incredibly unfair if they did that just because they're under-resourced. Yeah. Um, and that, but that, you know, there's always a risk of that. Um, but as you say, this is a this is a drug that is 
treating a condition that is desperately horrible to a small mm. number of people who've got it and it, mm. the, there'll be huge patient pressure if mm. the fda kind of strings out more and, and similarly in europe you know this mm. treatment is um it's, it's one of those conditions where you know a 20 percent improvement in eff- efficacy of treatment this is a cream it doesn't cure the condition but yeah. it soothes it a 20 percent improvement in that creates an 80 percent improvement in the life experience of the person with the mm. disease so it's mm. it's massively significant yeah we've got, got to be hope, hope that it, it gets approval yeah and also i think the um the european medical authority have asked for patient uh, responses and given that they hit the end point in phase three trials you'd be stunned if the patient responses weren't very very positive and desperate for it and i know that's what the management team have said before that they expect when they when they're able to launch this the uptake of it's going to be extremely strong because of the desperate state as you say of the quality of life of uh, these eb um, these eb patients another one on the uh, in the healthcare area that's actually doing really well it, on the back of sort of like you know the servicing is ergamed which is a, a cro and also does um, sort of like monitoring of how drug the efficacy of drugs post um, approval is, and it seems to be going from strength to strength. This one, yeah, delivers a great trading update mm. uh, um, last week, I think it was, and um, yeah, everything on track. It's and you know the link with Amrit there is that they specialise in rare and orphan diseases, mm. which is what Amrit do, but they're doing it from the, the services running the clinical trials end, and uh, you know it's proven to be a great place to be. Yeah. And it should be going forward as well, um, I'd, I'd imagine. Yes. Another one which is, um, well, it's in healthcare, but for animal healthcare is uh, is eco-animal um, health, which I think does sort of vaccines and drugs and stuff for largely sort of poultry and pigs and um, all kinds of different types of uh, and chickens and stuff like that. So, uh, and I know it had a bit of a struggle with its um, out in China, didn't it? Because pork prices went down. But it seems to have a huge sort of like um, pipeline of potential new treatments that seem to be, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, with great prospects. What, again, what's your sort of thoughts on um, on eco? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was obviously, you know, had a very tough year last year. It's mm. a resilient business. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it'll be absolutely fine. Yeah. Yeah. Another one, which, again, is a thing as has had a, had a great prospects is um is sensign health at all which i, I know it's 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 now really so it's, it's, on, it's got trying to get some emergency funding but um it's sort of like um it's an aggregator of anonymous patient anonymous data i think from largely in the healthcare but sort of across the world the idea being is then you can leverage that data to get insights into drug discovery into treatments and improved you know sort of like uh, uh, medical outcomes for patients etc which is a fabulous idea but i think there's how do you how do you treat a company with great potential but obviously is, is going through a difficulty raising money at the moment well you know i mean we thought they we thought they had a you know we're trying to do something very good and important and mm. we did support the company uh, a year ago and took a small holding in it um when they came out and said made the rather bizarre statement about the management buyout kind of idea mm-hmm. we got really uneasy about it because mm. just couldn't really understand what's going out on with it um we actually did start selling it down didn't mm. get very far with it and when they came out with the statement about the funding um we exited immediately because you know that that kind of statement is just not company and not a statement yeah. the company on the market should ever make i mean yeah. it's an extraordinary they got into that position mm. um i i mean I, I don't know how you know i have no idea how they how they got there really that was yeah that this is really not good um and for a company to be seeking emergency funding from uh non-market participants you know third party on, on terms that were not even finalized when they made the announcement so there's no mm. security there's no there's, there's nothing in the public domain which suggests that there's a deal financing done which will allow the company not to go bust very soon so mm. you know it's 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 right at the top end of the possible risk spectrum of anything on the market <laughs> yeah it does seem quite a binary play that one it's a, it's, it's certainly something that i would uh, not go uh, for it's been a painful to... experience for us and yeah know, well management yeah we, did, didn't do what we thought they were going to do in that yeah in that company so 
Yeah. Well, I mean, that, it's just inevitable with investing, isn't it? Particularly in the sort of small and mid cap is that you get, I mean, even in the large cap is that you're never going to be right all the time. But if you can be right sort of 60, 70 percent of the time and um, hold through sort of like, um, you know, hold good companies, then you've got as good a chance as any. Um, just on uh, what's your view on the UK um, house builders? Because, uh, again, they've sort of like come off quite a lot, actually, of like largely on negative concerns about um you know, the sort of the cladding issue, et cetera, but also, uh, you know, with if, if there are interest rate sort of like fears, then it's going to push up borrowing costs and mortgages for uh, potential first time home buyers. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we're quite, we're pretty positive about the UK house builders and, mm. and we own two in particular, mm. um, Vistry and Gleason. We yeah. really, really like both. They've both got big involved, substantial involvement in building social housing and mm. low cost housing. And um, the, the cladding issue, it, it clearly, you know, it's what has impacted sentiment, and particularly when Michael Gove was sort of talking about this blanket tax on the house building sector. Mm. And, you know, this it actually raises quite an important point because there's something I often bang on about. I think one of the UK, UK's biggest weaknesses is that we have almost no ability to really um, police bad corporate behaviour. Mm. And when we do, we do it in this crazy way where we impose effectively fines on perfectly completely innocent parties mm. as if that's going to make bad behavior go away you know we're kind of used to it in regulated businesses with uh, you know the sort of um fca levy where which you know somebody if a if financial advisors know all about this because one of them does something terrible mm. and goes bust all the others have to pay for it yeah and that's kind of exactly what's happening with the house builders under this new proposal mm. which i think is deeply unfair and really just a symptom of us our inability to actually go and find out who did something wrong and make them pay for it mm. and you know clearly the material suppliers are culpable here you know gleason has, has never built a um high-rise building mm. and vistry have got a tiny number from a legacy thing they acquired but it's really minuscule and they're both going to end up paying for other people's bad behavior in, in this yeah. sense but you know you could equally well say well what they built wasn't illegal. So what about the regulator? Why was that illegal to build those houses? Mm. And, um, you know, that, that would really, you know, from my point of view, I'd feel much better about the whole thing if there was actually a proper sense that this had been inquired into, that they found he was culpable and, and, and you know, imposed fines accordingly. And, you know, the companies, some of them would have gone bust maybe, but there are ways of doing it that you could... You know, the, the, the people who should pay for this are the companies that built them and profited from them, mm. not just anyone who's a house builder. Because you're a house builder, you should end up paying for cladding. But, you know, so but right now the, the market has really discounted this kind of blanket fine on everybody, mm. whether they're involved or not. So it has impacted history and Gleason. And actually, we think that's a real opportunity. Yeah. And then on the interest rates, you know, the question is how high are interest, rate, are interest rate? They are going to go up, but how high are they going to go? And how will that feed into house prices? I mean, right now, there's a record low uh, number of houses for sale in the UK, and uh, there's still a lot of a lot of savings. The savings rate, the household savings rate, from the last two years has been very high. Mm. So, I think the the picture for house prices is pretty strong still this year. Next year, with rates going up, with the household spending squeeze, we're going to see in April. You know, we could see it come under more pressure, but really, that you know, the 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 um the house prices are the house builders have become so derated and they're actually having they're performing very well at the moment that you know we remain pretty optimistic about that sector yeah, yeah. and i think if the if the house prices do fall say in 2023 or or flatten off then the supply chain incremental cost of covid likewise should should ease or even fall off itself because uh They've been paying sort of like, um, you know, through the nose for their raw materials and for the labour. And uh, yeah. that, that's that got to quieten off as well. So the, the margins probably are going to be reasonably resilient, I would have thought. Just yeah. on, so just finally then, just on a couple of very interesting sort of like um, other healthcare names that, again, the shares have come off, but they're well sort of like cashed up. Is uh, is Verici that sort of like does leading or next next generation diagnostics for um, for for human donor transplants like um, uh, kidneys, etc. And then we've got Trellis, which does uh, sort of like again really sort of like leading. Um, uh, resilience management um, software and uh, telemedicine um, for uh, it's it, uh, in uh, IBD, which is you know Crohn's and colitis. Yes, I mean you know both really interesting companies. Um, mm. 
both in the same stable as Renalytics yeah. uh, and, and um, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Very, it is integral to both of them. I mean, it's important to remember, though, they're both very early stage companies. Yeah. They're very small positions in our VCT. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, I think they're both on track doing what mm. they said they were going to do, but it's it's pretty early days. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're, they're early stage companies, but with, with good pedigree. Mm. Good. Okay. And then just finally, then just more, more broadly, anything to watch at all going forward? Obviously, we're going to be eyes over sort of Putin in the, in the sort of short term, but any other sort of like things to um to, to for investors to to mark and to monitor etc going forward um yeah i mean i think um you know we do we do need to keep an eye on government debt levels mm. um you know i, I suspect the, the, the high levels of government debt when, when we do have another proper crisis in the uk and i've no idea when that's going to be but mm. i think government debt level will be at the center of it so I'll keep an eye on that. And, and you know, I think, um, well, the arguments about the tax at the moment is, is very interesting and I can see it both ways. You know, I think personally, I think the Chancellor is right to insist that we don't, you know, we don't just carry on spending government money left, right and centre without ever raising any more. Mm. On the other hand, you know, there, there's several ways to see this tax rise and, you know, a big chunk of the reason why we need it are Brexit related costs and, and losses yeah. and the revenues the, the revenue, the UK revenue is probably 20, 25 million bi- billion below where it should be mm. as a result of lower GDP growth after Brexit. And, you know, we, so actually it's buried in all the news and Partygate and, and Crimea, mm. but, you know, actually the queues at Dover and the friction, the trade frictions, you know, we really need those to be sorted out. And, and you know, so far, basically so far Brexit's been a fiasco and it's been incredibly expensive for the country. Mm. And that's important because it's resulting in higher taxes and then the higher taxes cause slower growth. So this, you know, we need some smart moves to be made. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I think the Chancellor is a, a, a sensible voice to have in, in the mix there. And, and we, you know, we need a bit of actually conservatism to not go crazy with government debt mm. right now. So um, I would keep an eye on that. And, and, you know, it's something not to forget about. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I'm... I'm not. I'm not saying this is um, um, will happen. It's all going to happen, but it's to, you know th- there are risks building, and and we need policy to to keep a lid on it and, and yeah. to be sensible how it's managed. Mm. That could manifest itself, I suppose, through the exchange rate as well, couldn't it? It's if, if they don't uh, put a lid on the actual expending, then you could find that actually the exchange rate continues to well, softens off against the euro and against the US. And we'll wait. Well, it's, it's possible, but the problem is it, the government debt is also a problem in Europe and. Yeah, uh, in the US, and yeah, you know, the US is right in the front of this. And you know, some people I speak to in the US are expecting the dollar to weaken, mm. and that, that actually we could go into that kind of scenario. Yeah, and, you know, be, behind that, there's also you know, it's clear long term Russia and China, and particularly China, want to challenge the dollar's supremacy as the global reserve currency. Mm. And you know, that, that's a little bit like glacial change, but it's <laughs> the, the, the sort of you know, the glacial movements are. Uh, in that direction so you know that's going to be it's another thing to keep an eye on yeah it moves slowly all right okay well thanks very much uh, paul for fantastic insights and uh look forward in um in touching base in in sort of six months time and hopefully we'll have some pretty good news on a, a number of those stocks so um thanks very much fantastic thanks paul great to talk to you bye